And Bonnie, I want to start with uh, first North Korea, and I actually want to start with COVID in North Korea. I know that we're there's a concern about a missile test, and it's sort of typical with the typical Kim Jong Un looking for a little attention right now. But the fact is, this looks like we're about to have a, a human catastrophe in North Korea. Um, what can the world do about this in this closed society that feels as if this thing is spreading? I think I saw a stat today. Two million people may have it right now. Well, North Korea has only recently acknowledged that it has any cases at all. Um, and we don't know if the numbers that they are uh, providing to the outside world are reliable, but it's hard to believe that COVID isn't rampant in North Korea. Um, they don't have the health infrastructure or the vaccines to cope with it. So the world can provide uh, humanitarian assistance. And the new president in South Korea, I believe, has already offered uh, to provide assistance, especially in the form of vaccines and uh, protective mm -hmm. medical equipment. Uh, let me move to what I think the president's goal here. I mean, number one is, uh, as somebody who I remember when President Obama uh, went to Asia to unveil the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and it seemed like it was going to be a, uh, the beginning of what would become a check on China economically with the United States and some Southeast Asian countries, and of course, the domestic politics between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump essentially eviscerated that treaty. And now there's a baby step version of this, Bonnie. Can this be the beginning of an economic alliance that is a check on China, or is it too small of, a, of an idea? Well, the Indo-Pacific economic framework that President Biden is going to launch in Japan is an important step toward writing rules in ways that favor open economies and strengthen the rule-based multilateral trading system. Uh, but it doesn't provide or won't provide um, access to U.S. markets, which is what countries in the region want. They welcome the initiative, the interest in the United States in stepping up economically in the region, but they prefer the United States to return to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And yeah. indeed, many countries, I think, hope that the United States will. Do you think this is really the, our intent and that we're just sort of taking a step here, seeing if we can get there domestically and then another step down the road? I think that the Biden administration has held its cards very close to its chest on this issue. There are obviously political risks in even talking about returning to the CPTPP. Um, and so I would not be surprised if even after the midterms that it is not a policy that the Biden administration will pursue. Well, as, as someone told me, it is not going to be something they're not going to pursue something that they want a vote in Congress to have to approve on something like that. Let me move to the Quad. Uh, and it's sort of the beginning of what is, feels like a security alliance that could continue to grow. Uh, what is the best way to grow the Quad and to make it more than just sort of an informal meeting of four countries with interest in worrying about China? Well, the Quad, which includes the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, um, uh, is now sort of in its second incarnation. It's uh, really focused on providing public goods like vaccines to countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, climate is on the agenda, um, as well as uh, issues like maritime uh, cooperation. But there's more and more going on in the realm of security. Um, and I think that there is potential to do more. These countries are concerned about protecting their interests and supply chains, of course, but also they are concerned about Chinese assertiveness and potential aggression in the region. And so I think that there is a lot of potential uh, to grow cooperation and also to include other countries, not as mm -hmm. members of the Quad, but just as working with the Quad countries in these working groups that they have set up. And before I let you go, uh, I want to ask, and this is not something we told you we were going to ask about, so my apologies uh, beforehand, but in the past, whenever a U.S. president was going to have a meeting with India, we always went out of our way to make sure we had some sort of event, conversation, whatever, with Pakistan. That's not happening this time. Is this just another sign of just how, how far away we are the United States and Pakistan, how far apart they are these days compared to where they were even just five years ago. Well, yes, I think that the relationship with the United States and Pakistan has evolved, but more importantly, the relationship with India has evolved. 
uh, President Biden has had many conversations with India's President Modi um, as part of this quad. They are working together very closely. Uh, obviously, Pakistan has been a thorn in the U.S.-India relationship. But I think going forward, um, uh, this is going to be an area where you know, there are other, this is one issue in which the U.S. and India agree to disagree. There will be others. But I think that the Biden administration felt that that phone call or heads up pre-notification just was not necessary. And it shows you how much, as, you're, as you put it, uh, the U.S. and India relationship is growing closer all the time. Bonnie Glazier with the German Marshall Fund. Always appreciate getting your expertise. Thank you. Thank you.